I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 37 this morning. Look more closely at a particular verse that we would try to understand it perhaps better than we have before and find ways to apply it to our lives and our circumstances. That verse is Psalm 37, verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, I told someone recently that I was going to teach on this verse, and he said, oh, yeah, if I delight myself in the Lord, he'll give me that Italian sports car that I've been wanting. I, I think it's called Lamborghini. <laughs> oh, there it is right there. <laughs> you know, uh, it's a common view that some have that if I follow God, he'll give me everything I want or nearly everything I want. And I think we'll come to see that this verse is not teaching that at all. But like any verse or verses in the Bible that we're drawn to, to quote or to claim as a promise, it's important to try to see the whole as well as the part. And Psalm 37 is a psalm of David. And if you found that place in your Bible He gets right to it in verse 1. He says, Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious because of wrongdoers. Notice in verse 7 and verse 8, he repeats pretty much the same thing. Do not fret about those who prosper when they carry out evil. Fret comes from a word that means to get burned or distressed or heated up over something, often something that you cannot change or have control over. And in this case, it was that kind of heated response to those people who were distressed at the prosperity of evil people when the troubles and problems and attacks against people who walk with God seem to be commonplace. It's especially concerning Because in those days, it was thought that material prosperity was a sign of God's blessing. A couple of weeks ago, Kathy and I were out in Nathrop, Colorado, and we were visiting with Heath Wharton, who was the director of Mountains Move. It's a ministry that serves military veterans and families and really anyone who needs a reset in their life in the mountains. And we sat on a bench outside of a corral that contained two wild Mustangs. And uh, Heath told us a story about one of the veterans who had been there in the last several months. And uh, he was sitting on that same bench that we were sitting on. He told the story about this guy how he was consumed with anger. And it was anger that had been fueled by his exposure, or really overexposure, to social media. He was mad. He was frustrated. He was angry at our world, at our country, at our leaders, at the the moral vacuum that seems to exist all around us. He was boiling over mad at the direction of our country. And while this vet sat outside of the corral on that bench, Heath said he was just not sure what to do. There was a wild Mustang named Carbon, the black one that was in the corral, and Heath decided to bring in an empty oat bag. And he said as soon as he brought in that empty oat bag, this Mustang just went crazy. Carbon went mad. He just exploded. And uh, he was allowing that outside influence to just carry over into his whole life. That empty oat bag couldn't hurt him, but by his reaction to it, he was letting it control him. Something that was outside of his control, outside of his influence. And at once, he said the vet saw himself in this. He was letting an external thing He was letting his perspective on life be overly shaped by the media. He was letting, he said, I'm letting social media control me and guide my life. He had lost his moral compass. He had lost the inner 
compass that he had. And isn't it a perplexity still that no matter what generation we're a part of, much, much, much can trouble us. Moral challenges, feeling like the world as you once knew it is falling apart and everyone doing what's right in his own eyes. So if anger and fret and worry are issues for you right now, if you're heated up about things, perhaps overheated, about ready to explode, Psalm 37 has a good word for you. Now, a brief summary, I think we could go like this. Verses 1 through 11, confused and worried people of God don't understand something, and they react to it. Wicked and evil people are prospering, and David in his writings here emphatically urges them to not respond in some ways, but rather do respond in other ways. First, the don'ts. Don't respond this way. You've seen verse 1, verse 7, verse 8 repeated, not to fret. But also verse 8, interesting enough, he says, refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Isn't that something? He singles that out. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Instead, respond the following ways. The do's. Notice, in addition to verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord. Verse 3, he says, trust in the Lord and do good. Commit your way to the Lord. Verse 5, be still before the Lord, wait patiently for him, and reinforces that in verse 9, wait for the Lord. Notice these positive encouragements far outweigh the negatives that are listed here. They should win the day. When we want to react with worry, with anger, with rage, with wrath, with revenge, trust do good, delight, commit, and wait, and see how all of these are in relation to God. Verses 12 through 20, the wicked will be disappointed in the end. Their expectations won't be met. David states this by way of contrast. Now, ill-gotten gains, the seeming success of wickedness is doomed and to summarize verse 13 and 20, verse 13, the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that their day is coming. And verse 20, the enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastures. They vanish like smoke. They vanish away. Verses 21 through 31, things are going to get better for the righteous. Now, there's a recurring thought here, and that's the promise of the land that David describes. Verse 22, those blessed by the Lord shall inherit the land. Verse 29, the righteous shall inherit the land. And there's promise of land in other sections, too, of this psalm. We saw it for a bit in verse 3, but then verse 11, the meek shall inherit the land. Verse 34, God will exalt you to inherit the land. Clearly, I think there's a connection here in this psalm with Jesus' beatitude in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I hope there are a lot of meek people here today and watching online. Not meek in the sense of weak, but meek in the sense, in the way that Jesus was teaching about it. Those who, those who know how much they need God. Those who aren't fighting against God. Those who aren't striving against God. Those who aren't preoccupied with their self. But they're drawing on God's power on God's resources. Like Paul, maybe kicking and screaming, he came to the point where he saw that God's power was made perfect 
in his weakness. It's a life of inner strength. I think it's the life that that vet who was sitting outside that corral was really looking for. Some life on the inside that help, could help him to navigate and not just navigate, but still thrive in a country and a culture with so much discord. Verses 23 and 24, our steps are made firm by the Lord when he delights in our way. Though we stumble, we shall not fall headlong, for the Lord holds us by the hand. And then verses 32 through 40, the final well-being of the righteous and the destruction of the wicked are contrasted. Wicked people may be after you, but God is with you and won't abandon you. There's a future for the man of peace, not so for the wicked. Faith doesn't always have the understanding or the answers to the questions. But he comes back, verse 34, to wait for the Lord and keep his way. The, the call of this psalm is a call for trust, really. Trust in God, delighting in God, committing yourself to God, resting in God, waiting on God. And verse 40, the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their refuge in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and rescues them. He rescues them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Now, I have a couple of books in my library by a guy. You have to check him out. W. Graham Scroggy. He died in 1958, but he, he wrote some powerful works. And uh, I'd like to share that slide here. He says, these exhortations reduced it to essence are faith and patience, both of which are needed if we are to face up a right to this or any other moral or spiritual problem. In God's government of the world, time as well as trust is a factor. So faith and patience, time as well as trust, let us remember that the Almighty is working on a great scale and will not be hustled by our peevish impetuosity. Now, some of you guys will be checking out those definitions on your iPhones or some other way here shortly, and that's okay. Don't have to be hustled by our peevish impetuosity. It is better for us... Now, listen to this. It is better for us to be occupied with doing good than to spend our time worrying over other people doing evil. Is that an action plan for us in our country, in our world, in Tanzania, wherever we might be, God placing us? To be occupied with doing good more than to spend our time worrying over other people doing evil. Why? Well, because in God's grand design, evil and wickedness, wickedness, they have a very short lifespan. God bless you. God bless me for fighting injustice, for fighting for the good, for standing up for the right, for being involved in ways like sin can be so demonstrative in our world, in our lives. But... but Remember that sin and injustice and hatred of good will be removed. They'll be gone. They'll be nada. They'll be kaput. Where did that one come from? <laughs> we know that ultimately in heaven and a new heaven and a new earth, and as Pastor John led us in prayer this morning, the Lord Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, and he shall reign forever and ever. Okay, so now, oh my, <laughs> 10.08, <laughs> we come to our verse. <laughs> Delight yourself in the Lord. Remember, it's just one of several strong exhortations for believers living in a world gone crazy. But it's a really important one to delight yourself in the Lord, to, to turn on that switch, to move the clicker, to change the channel from fret, from worry, from anger, from envy, 
to delighting yourself in the Lord. Turn your emotional focus from being so upset to delighting in God, which means to take great pleasure in God, to feel great favor toward God, to enjoy God, to trust in God. The word delight is used for a garment that is delicate, that it's soft, that it's luxurious. One writer puts it this way, picture yourself sinking into soft satin sheets. Like a little kid who keeps that blanket so close to be comforted, to be secure, to be warm. Have you got a blanket this morning? Okay. I thought maybe you did. But you got the comfort of sitting with your mother. Awesome. We enjoyed time with several grandchildren on vacation. And uh, we would cuddle up close to each other on the couch. One of them later told his mother, I could cuddle up with Papa all night. Guess who Papa is? <laughs> Taking delight implies pleasure and enjoyment. Cuddling up close, just enjoying being together. Talking, talking, listening, being quiet, being silent. I think that connects with the Abba, Father, that we find in the New Testament. Relational, called taking refuge in God, the safest, most secure place to be. Our relationship with God is modeled in the Trinity. From this book called With by Sky Jathani, who quotes Kevin DeYoung, he says, with a biblical understanding of the Trinity, we can say that God did not create in order to be loved, but rather created out of the overflow of the perfect love that has always existed between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who ever live in perfect and mutual relationship and delight. delight. Life with God is different than other things because its goal is God. He ceases to be a device we employ or a commodity we consume. Instead, God himself becomes the focus of our desire. But before we can really desire God, we must have a clear understanding of who he is and what he is like. And in this relationship, we enjoy God for who he is. Now, there is a pretty extended quote by Charles Spurgeon that I've got up there. I think I'll go ahead and read it. He says, delight yourself also in the Lord. Make Jehovah the joy and rejoicing of your spirit. There is no room for fretting if we remember that God is ours. But there's every incentive to sacred enjoyment of the most elevated and ecstatic kind. Every name, every attribute, every word, every deed of Jehovah should be delightful to us. And in meditating thereon, our soul should be as glad as the epicure, that is one who is really has a sensitive and discriminating taste for food and drink, who feeds delicately with a profound relish for his dainties. Yeah, you can define a few terms on that one too. Maybe John Piper, when he says, delighting yourself in God includes seeing God as the most admirable person and reality in the universe. Delighting in God means savoring the diverse excellencies of God, especially as they're manifest in Christ and as they come to fulfillment at the cross of Jesus Christ. We'll be celebrating the Lord's table in a few minutes, remembering what Jesus did for us, dying on the cross, the impact that has on our life now and throughout all eternity. But I was thinking about some of the different authors that have meant a lot to me over the year and years and in this relationship enjoying God for who he is and certainly if you have the patience to read Jonathan Edwards religious affections parts of that but A.W. Tozer who some people here have a connection with he wrote the knowledge of the holy and the pursuit of God to restore a sense of wonder and because in his generation, he felt like there was so much of a lowering of, of God, who he really is. 
or Chuck Swindoll intimacy with the Almighty or Brother Lawrence practicing the presence of God or the Valley of Vision, some Puritan prayers or My Heart Christ's Home by Robert Boyd Munger. One that I've used that's been helpful to me is Ruth Meyer's 31 Days of Praise. Just coming to be able to enjoy God for who he is. Music can help to delight yourself in the Lord. I know the songs selected this morning were purposeful. One clear result is that we could come into God's presence together and think about him as attributes, who he is and what he's done. I think of so many songs that have impacted my life and I'm sure yours. One that I've heard recently, I think our choir did, Mark, uh, a few months ago, called Draw Me Nearer, where you, you take Fanny Crosby's hymn, the blind hymn writer, Draw Me Nearer, and there's a choral arrangement that uh, has been done, and I've been listening over and over and over again to one version by, done by California Baptist University of choir and orchestra, Draw Me Nearer, Draw Me Nearer. It's powerful. Or I can only imagine, I can only imagine, or my Jesus, I love thee, or blessed assurance, or in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus, or his strength is perfect when our strength is gone. You know what, how we ended our elders and pastors who were present, our meeting last Monday night, just over there in the connections room? And uh, Mark, you had your guitar, and we sang from Build My Life, all together, holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes in wonder, show me who you are and fill me with your heart, and lead me in your love to those around me. That's how your elders ended their meeting together last Monday night. Music helps to delight ourselves in the Lord. Now, is all of this idea of delighting yourself in God, is this escapism? Avoiding problems, looking for some relief before you wake up in the real world? Certainly not. Remember who wrote this? David. David, the youngest in his family, misunderstood by his older brothers, torn with loyalty to King Saul, but constantly escaping Saul's wrath, fighting his enemies, tempted and persuaded and did commit adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband murdered. And as a result, it affected the whole family and kingdom, his daughters, Absalom, Abimelech <clears throat> out to get their dad's throne. A sour, a marriage that turns sour with Michael. But way back when, when he had a band of men and he was not king yet, and he was involved in so many areas of southern Israel and battles and so forth and fighting. He was away with his men and his wife, their wives and children were taken by the Amalekites. And when they got back to Ziklag, David was greatly distressed for the, the men spoke of stoning him. But you know what David did according to 1 Samuel 30 verse 6? David strengthened himself in the Lord. He encouraged himself in the Lord. I believe he delighted himself in the Lord. No, this isn't, this isn't a, some kind of escapism issue. This relationship develops in trusting God and his word. Delight yourself in the Lord is always founded and based upon what God reveals in the word of God, how God reveals himself and his plan. I was with three friends recently and asked them about delighting yourself in the Lord and how it's based on the Word of God. And Keith said, 
And this is eternal life, John 17, 4, that they know you in Jesus' prayer, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And Keith shared that this verse changed everything for him, for his focus and his relationship with God, knowing God and wanting to know God, recognizing that this is eternal life, to know God. So why not get to know him now and better and better and better before heaven? And David said, you know, Revelation 2.17 encourages me to delight myself in the Lord where there's this promise. I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. And thinking about the mass of humanity, when you walk into a thunder basketball game or something like this and you see all the people you can feel like, you know, you're all alone. But recognizing the personal nature of God with individual persons, with a new name, a stone written on that stone that no one knows except the one who receives it and God. And then Phil said, you know, I had a background of good works and spiritual insecurity. And through the church here and through others, just opened up the Bible in a new way to me of looking at God. In 1 John 5, 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. And being able to delight in a relationship with God where he feels secure, knowing that his salvation is secure because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Now I know... <laughs> I gotta tell you the truth. I had so much time to prepare for this. I have so much material, and it's unlike what I normally would do. But I kept telling Kathy, I said, I gotta cut this, I gotta cut that, I gotta cut this, and I'm gonna cut a bunch. But I do wanna say, and he will give you the desires of your heart, the ultimate conclusion what is the desire of your heart and my heart? Ultimately, it's for God himself. And I think that when we learn to delight ourselves in the Lord and not be caught and captured so much by our circumstances and the culture we live in, but coming back again, 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 and again, returning to this Coming to God, playing the, the long game, steady as she goes, stay on the path. This isn't a constant, nor should we expect it to be a, a continual state of emotional high. No. It's a call to keep coming back, no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what's going on in the world, to keep coming back to God and coming back to his throne of grace and fighting for seeing him for who he really is, not what other people say he is like or what you feel he might be like at times, but coming to him in who he really is. That's where life is found. And uh, so if that Lamborghini is in your present or in your past or in your future, God bless you. But don't make it the goal of your life. Make God and growing in relationship to God the goal and purpose and passion of your life. So, Father, we trust you today for your grace to help us to continue to come to Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, and to fix our eyes on him and to put genuine trust in him and find hope in him and him alone. We thank you for this wonderful thing that you're doing, continuing to do through spreading the good news about Jesus Christ throughout all the world. We pray we'd be faithful to making disciples of all nations and uh, to trust you, O oh God, for the strength and power to persist. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.